Good morning everyone, welcome at our Pentecost service uh, today. It is an uh, amazing uh, marker on the church calendar. Um, it is one of the biggest festivals in our church here where we really celebrate the outpouring of the Spirit. When I think about um, celebration, I, I love to think about festivals, you know, food and drink and smells and tastes and atmosphere. And in a way, it's difficult, I think, for us to, to really be in a celebratory mood when we are, um, you know, currently still in lockdown. Um, so to try to at least sensitize you for your surroundings, for where you are sitting now and for what's going on around yourself, um, I want to invite you to, for a moment, try to, to work multi-sensory, to, be, to, to become aware of um, the crispness of the cold winter air um, that's around us. Um, I'm going to light us a candle um, and I want you to not just, you know, take note of it with your head, but to see it really with your eyes, to, to realize like that this is a symbol of the fact that God is with us, um, that we have been celebrating uh, through ages. Um, I'm going to read us a, a quote from um, Bishop Ignatius. And while I'm reading it, I want you to try to, to picture, to see in your, in your, in your mind's eye um, what he's trying to, to convey to us. He says, without the Spirit, God is far away. Christ stays in the past. The Gospel is a dead letter. The church is simply an organization, authority a matter of domination, mission a matter of propaganda, liturgy no more than an evocation, Christian living a slave morality. But with the Holy Spirit, the cosmos is resurrected and groans with the birth pangs of the kingdom. The risen Christ is there. The gospel is the power of life. The church shows forth the life of the Trinity. Authority is a liberating service. Mission is a Pentecost. And the liturgy is both memorial and, anticip and anticipation. Human action is deified. So in a way, Ignatius uh, writes about the Holy Spirit as life-giving, as fulfilling, as an entity that fills us with meaning. And um, in a way, I want to try to to draw lines between um, life-giving water and the Spirit. As I uh, poured some coffee and sugar and milk in this cup of mine, it actually wasn't a drink until I've put some water in. It is as if it fills us and in a way um, sensitizes us um, for the beauty that's within I want to invite you to, to listen to a song now um, that he, that's performed by Dalmary um, from Helios. And she's going to sing Holy Spirit by Jesus Culture. So uh, while we are focusing on, on the words of the song, I also want to invite you to take a moment to pray then with us. Um, today is also a national prayer day. Um, President asked of us to, uh, to pray as faith communities across across the board. And so let's use this song as a time of reflection and of prayer towards the people that's on the forefront of, of the COVID-19, um, people that's already struggling with the disease, all our medical staff in the country, um, the teams that's trying to create um, a vaccine for this, this illness, uh, for financial and social outcome. Yeah, I'm inviting you to it. See 
you're aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become Let us read the text then together. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors closed and locked for fears of the Jews, you know, for the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. When I read the scripture, the piece that really struck me was where it says, uh, after he showed them um, his hands and the mark in his side, um, they were overjoyed when they when they saw the Lord, and um, it, I think there's a link that we need to make between um, our current circumstance and under lockdown, the fact that we are sitting here talking about a festivity of Pentecost, but then we are sitting, um, you know, kind of confined to our own spaces. Du Marie told me that in the week she went to the pharmacy. And uh, while she was standing in line there uh, at, at the counters, she said she totally felt um, strange, you know, not just because of the situation, but there was a, a few people in the line. And, and she felt almost as if they were looking to her with fear. And that's kind of strange. I mean, I don't think she's a, a fearful person, but the reality is that we, when we look at one another, as strangers in this time, uh, we perceive one another with suspicion. We, we fear, in a way, um, the presence of the other because we sense that maybe this person can, can give me, uh, can carry over the, the COVID-19 virus onto me. And so I think what we see in this time is a lot of, of fear and a lot of suspicion. And sometimes it even becomes some anger and desperation and rage even then on the other side i think there's people that totally um you know detract themselves from from situations that you know totally fearful um do not want to i think almost um you know try even uh, to to continue with life it is as if our primal reactions um is taking over we are fighting or or we are fleeing. It's 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 absolutely fight or flight, um, and I think it is so necessary to realize like that one of the main things that Jesus did um, through his life on earth was that he he showed us a third way. There's there's another way, um, and that is always the way of of making a stand through love, radical um, love in 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 difficult situations and circumstances. 
I think uh, as a church, that is most probably where we are. We're asking the question, what do we do now? Um, do we let this primal fear uh, or, you know, um, emotion of fighting or flighting take a hold of us and, and, and we, we make that kind of the, the primary thing that we react out of? Or is there a third way for us? Is there a way that we can... Um, try to to embody and radically love um, what God has put in front of us. The disciples uh, in this uh, space where we find them locked in a room um, is definitely also in a space of reaction. Um, they just lost their leader. Jesus has been crucified. Um, some of them wanted to flee. Uh, Peter wanted to fight. Um, and it's because of their fear for the Jews that they are um, locked up in, in a room. Uh, there's this fear in the atmosphere and it's tinted by grief and loss. And I don't even think they knew who they were at that, mo at, at, at that stage. Um, and so usually when we speak about uh, the happenings of Pentecost, um, we're not that very familiar with the John 20, the, one, the scripture that we read. We really refer back to Acts 2. And um, it's also a room where it's locked, but then we, we focus, we tend to focus on um, uh, the sound of wind and, you know, the flames that's divided uh, amongst the disciples in the room. Um, and so here in John 20, we really experience a different reaction. It's kind of a toned down, um, broad strokes uh, uh, way of talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We don't see joyous celebrations and people speaking in tongues. Um, there's kind of a different reaction. And I think we should um, try to understand that. Uh, I think the, the reaction is one where the disciples know that the people that they were they're going to encounter when they walk out of that doors, the religious leaders then, was the people that shouted, give us Barabbas, not Jesus, we, we don't want him, we, and we definitely don't want his followers. Um, it's, it's a strange situation for them, they, um, they really fear for their lives. What is a marker for me is that, that Jesus enters into their midst, midst. Um, almost announcing after his death, after the fact that they most probably understood at that stage, they've been defeated, the cause has been um, nullified, um, he enters. And it is in this locked up, fearful space where they encounter maybe the real Jesus for this, the first time, the, the one that's risen, the one that meet them um, anew. And, and they see him, not just for the bodily person who he is and was, but as God. It is in this space of experiencing their fear and their uncertainty um, that Jesus reveals himself, shows himself to them, and they know and experience he is present. I... I think there is so much to say about that in our situation at the moment. Um, it is unprecedented what's happening globally. It is um, unknown uh, to a major extent um, for, for our world population. Um, luckily, we have a few people that can refer us back to, to the Spanish flu epidemic in our country as well. But then the reality is... Uh, that Jesus is present and, and that he's in, his, in our midst and that it is maybe exactly in this tension space of, of fear and of anxiety where we um, hopefully see him um, for who he really is. I think another thing um, is that Jesus really doesn't need our open doors. I think um, we are so programmed when it comes to the Holy Spirit to think that you know, everything must be correct and, and right. Like, you know, the, 
the keyboard must just start at the right moment and then like the electrical guitarist will come in with a thread and um, you know we create this kind of thought pattern even through our song um, that we should create open spaces you are welcome here Holy Spirit that's what we sang and in a way I think what I read here is, is contrary to that that even behind closed doors, even in spaces where we do not accept or don't want it to be pre present, God is. Um, you wouldn't let a closed door keep him out. He, he knocks hard uh, on the reality of today and he's present. I want to um, explore this further with you and and for a moment, just stand still at the first word thing that Jesus says when he enters in this fearful, heavy, heavily tinted atmosphere amongst the disciples. He says to them, peace, peace be with you. And so I think it is a very loaded term um, in this situation. It is uh, then, according to John, the first word that, that he's speaking to this group of disciples after his res resurrection. He, he just literally saw um, the woman at the grave and, and now he's seeing his disciples. And so when he says peace, it's as if he's recalling the whole idea of shalom. And so, so shalom is the, is the Hebrew word for peace. But it is so much more than what we understand under peace. It is a word that uh, culminates towards harmony. It's speaking about wholeness. It's speaking about a completeness and a, a, even a prosperity and a welfare and a tranquility and a, just everything is good and swell. Um, that's in a way shalom. And not just in the here and the now, but then also across borders. Um, Something like reconciliation and justice and peace is all taken up into this one word. And so when Jesus greets his disciple by, disciples by saying, Shalom, peace to you, uh, he's announcing something more than just uh, a nice word or a greeting. He's actually breathing, saying something of new hope and new life in this fearful situation and so i wondered about that like what do we experience when we have the privilege to be under the greeting blessing of the lord when when he's when when we greet one another and say peace be to you from the father the son and the spirit um are we aware of the fact that that god is in a way um announcing himself as life and hope peace Uh, I want to jump to verse 20 with you, where it says, After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So, like, I mean, when we read this and we know something of the background of what just happened, you know, to the disciples with the crucifixion and like the, uh, the fact that they all splintered across Jerusalem, um, I think... Firstly, when we hear peace be with you, I think we kind of might think that Jesus is quite insensitive to the situation that this poor disciples are in. It's as if he's uh, not totally present. I mean, he's just kind of announcing, hey, guys, there's peace. Yet it says he shows them his hands and his feet. And I think that is really meaningful. In the states, it's as if uh, the the scribes wants us to realize, like, like God is grounded in here and now. It's not just a pie in the sky. Everything's gonna be okay. You'll be fine one day. It is raw and it is concrete. It is uh, Thomas putting his hands or his fingers in the holes in Jesus's hands and putting his hand in his side, it is, it is raw. And it is out of that space where he carried the sin of the whole world, of the universe on him, that
that Jesus announces peace. I want to invite you then to, to let go of the thought pattern that maybe God is just calling us to a one day, not really making concrete effort to understand and to know and to dwell in our current situation, not just in COVID-19, but I'm talking like economically and socially and in homes where children and wives and, and men are used and abused. He is showing us his hands and his feet and his side and he's announcing peace. He's announcing shalom in a way that we are invited into living something of that reality. I hope you see that um, when it comes to, to kingdom, um, in the economy of the kingdom, death and life is in a way connected and kissing. It is as if despair and hope and uh, loss and gain is all kind of mixed together as the mixture of wine and gall that Jesus had to drink when he was hanging on the cross. It is where we meet God in this mixture, mixture of things. It is where in a way he breathes in, where he gives his spirit, where his kingdom starts to show and flourish. It is in this space then where the disciples fear are taken away and they rejoice because they see him. I want to end off with um, two last remarks. Uh, the text doesn't stop here. Uh, there's then also an instruction after God announcing, announcing peace out of his um, suffering, out of our suffering, announcing a new reality here and now. He, he says, I'm sending you. I'm sending you. Um, you should go. Spread this. Live this. Uh, embody this. Be, in a way, the kingdom. I love the verse in Corinthians that says, he entrusted the message of reconciliation to us. An Afrikaan sê dit, hy die bediening van die versoening aan ons toe vertrouw. It is a powerful phrase to me personally. It is as if God had this whole universe to choose from. And he looked at humankind and he said, You should be peace on earth. You should be the ones carrying this message of hope and of life and of embodying something of the kingdom of love uh, today. And it is after this, then in verse 22, where it says, Jesus breathed over them and he said, receive my spirit. It lets me think that it is expect, especially for this purpose that God gives his spirit to us, that he says, because of the fact that you should Go, that you should be, that you should embody, for that I give you the gift of the Spirit. It is the life-giving gift of life. May that thing, as a last remark, uh, help you to discover that the Spirit of God um, is a spirit of celebration. But it is also a spirit that is amongst us in the year and now. May God show you the third ways, the, the other ways in your situations. May He open doors for you where you think they are closed. May He um, become more real and fierce in His humanness in our minds. And may He become godly in the way that you worship and honor Him in every aspect of your life. I want to send you out then um, to go and be shalom, go and be peace, take, um, take God with you, um, or rather let God take you with on his journey, so go and be the peace, let him breathe over you and um, be recreated. And hope seems like a ship that's lost at sea. My enemies on every side, and I'm tempted to run and hide. You 
gentle wind.